No, no, all good, all good. All good, yes. <laughs> Wait two minutes. Uh, sounds good. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. No problem. I guess maybe we get started. So um, welcome everyone to the last uh, lecture. Uh, so in this lecture, uh, we will cover um, we will cover um, first limitations of topological codes. Uh, I will briefly tell you uh, what is the price that we pay by imposing geometric locality of our stabilizers. And this will motivate um, the uh, definition and uh, construction of uh, quantum LDPC codes where this geometric locality uh, is uh, removed, this constraint is removed. Um, and uh, then I will um, switch gears uh, a little and tell you about single shot error correction. Um, and this will, uh, and I will just mention at the end uh, how you know single shot and quantum LDPC, they can be, uh, uh, um, Connected. So um, yeah. So so let's let's uh, get started. So um, so far uh, in my talk and in uh, other talks, we we discussed uh, mostly say storage, 
Uh, but, you know, we may, uh, if we want to have a quantum computer, we want to do computation, right? So we want to implement um, any quantum algorithm. And in order to implement um, any quantum algorithm, we better be able to implement um, some, some unitary U, right? You want to implement some unitary U. So uh, how, how would you do that? Would you need to um, design your quantum computer to um, implement every unitary gate, every unitary operation that you may come up with? Well, not really. Uh, it turns out that uh, there exists a universal set of gates. Uh, so basically, with uh, just a few different uh, unitary gates, uh, we can uh, either implement exactly or approximately any unitary. So, um, you know, some unitary could be implemented as a C naught, uh, then there would be some uh, Hadamard gate, and uh, then maybe some T gate, another C naught, uh, T, and so on. So, um, what, uh, what I uh, wrote here is uh, three types of gates the, the Hadamard gate. And the T gate, which is um, this, this phase gate, uh, one e to i pi over four, and the uh, C naught gate. And uh, those three gates happen to be universal. And uh, importantly, if I want to uh, approximate this unitary uh, up to some uh, up to some uh, precision delta. Uh, the number of gates that I need to use scales uh, polylogarithmically in one over delta. So this is the statement of uh, solovic type theorem. So, um, okay, so now if we want to do computation, the problem kind of simplifies. We don't have to think about uh, how we do any unitary gates. We just think of how to do basic uh, gates that form a universal gate set, and then we're done. Of course, there is a problem, how do I uh, synthesize you from those gates. And this is, this is not an easy problem, but I'm not going uh, to think about it uh, in this talk. So um, that's all great, uh, but this is just, you know, what I drew to you is a quantum circuit. This is how we envision, um, you know, running quantum algorithms in a circuit model of computation. Um, but here we're thinking about ideal gates. But in reality, you know, you will be unable to implement Hadamard perfectly on your quantum device. There will be some level of noise. Uh, on classical computers, the level of noise is so minute that we don't have to worry uh, unless we do some uh, very large scale computation on uh, clusters. We don't have to worry about doing classical computation in a fault tolerant way because our basic logic operations are so reliable that, you know, we don't care. But on quantum computers, we believe that uh, those operations will not be that good, even if we try really, really hard. And um, our gate could fail with, you know, uh, one in a thousand. Uh, and th th those levels of uh, precision are uh, incommensurate with running algorithms that uh, comprise, say, a billion or, or, or more gates. So what do we need to do? Well, uh, we need to uh, think of, okay, so I'll, what, uh, what we need to do is we, we just need to add bars to those guys, meaning uh, we need to think of uh, doing logical C, not logical Hadamard, logical T gate. And uh, each wire is not a single qubit, rather it's a, it's a quantum error correcting code encoding you know, say one logical qubit, and then we do a logical C naught between two code blocks, each encoding one logical qubit. And uh, this is basically uh, how uh, fault tolerant, uh, how fault tolerance can be achieved. We want to run some, um, some circuit, but we don't run it uh, in an unprotected fashion. We uh, basically map it to some fault tolerant uh, realization of this circuit. And uh, a way to do it is to replace each wire by a quantum error correcting code, uh, encoding one logical qubit, and then doing logical gates between those guys. Is, is that clear? All good? Um, so one, so how, uh, how do we do those gates? Well, um, 
in principle, if we if we uh, have some um, information encoded in a quantum error correcting code, I could implement logical T gate by first unencoding, getting the unprotected qubit, then doing the physical T gate on it, and then encoding it back to the code space. Right? This would be this would be a solution, but it would be a bad solution because it wouldn't be fault tolerant because when I have the unprotected qubit, you know, some noise can um, affect it and destroy uh, or change the state or, you know, destroy uh, the qubit. So, um, so that's, that's obviously not good. No, it's smaller. But like a logical, for example, on a toric code, applying a logical gate requires many physical gates. Uh, well, it's, there's a difference between uh, you applying the gate versus environment applying the gate, right? Because you know what you're doing, and presumably, you know, you have enough control in your system that you, you know, you want to do Pauli's along some string, and you can do them fairly reliably versus the environment, which does it, you know, in some stochastic way. So um, what we're after is we are doing logical gates in a coordinated fashion, and for those gates, the uh, the uh, failure rate would be significantly suppressed. Which brings me to the point, uh, how do we do that, right? Because this method that I just told you is, is very naive, but uh, what, what is very appealing in the context of fault tolerance and doing uh, logical gates is this notion of transversal gates. Uh, or um, more generally, uh, gates that are implemented by constant uh, depth uh, quantum circuits. So uh, what are those? Well, transversal, oh, um, let me not destroy. It. So uh, transversal gates uh, can be thought of as, you know, I have qubits, and uh, now I apply a gate, a unitary gate, that is a tensor product of a single qubit unitary gates. So the logical Pauli's, for instance, for the stabilizer codes could be implemented that way. I just apply Pauli's on different locations. And uh, those transversal gates are naturally fault tolerant because if there is some pre-existing error on this qubit, and now I apply uh, this gate, uh, this qubit will not propagate because I don't have any uh, entangling gates. Uh, and a similar story um, morally applies to constant depth quantum circuits. Those would be those would be comprised of a few layers of gates, possibly you know, uh, entangling gates. So uh, what can happen is um, if I have some error, pre-existing error, and if I apply a constant depth circuit, it may spread a bit. And how will that spread? Well, it will spread within uh, the light cone here. So it will spread like that. Uh, but still, it is its spread is um, done in a fairly controllable fashion and that is the that is what we're after we want to have gates that do not spread errors in an uncontrollable way so um could we have a universal set of transversal gates uh, well it turns out that life is not so simple and there is the uh, no go result by uh, easting and knill uh, that says that uh, that says that uh, there's no non-trivial uh, local error detecting code uh, for which we have a universal set of um, transversal gates. So no quantum code with um, universal set 
of transversal gaze. So that's that's a bummer, and because we would be done. Uh, and uh, here, uh, what we require is that um, we have some number of subsystems. They don't have to be qubits, but there is a finite number of them. So the no uh, uh, number of subsystems is, is finite. And the, um, the dimension of local Hilbert space is also uh, finite. So, uh, and we require that our a uh, quantum code is non-trivial, meaning it can detect, okay, you know, it doesn't have to be quantum error correcting code. It, it's actually, you know, quantum error detecting code, meaning any error on a single subsystem is detected. So, you know, if we have quantum error correcting code uh, that has distance greater than one, you know, it's uh, it, it falls, uh, into this category and, and therefore is limited by this no-go result. But notice that this, this no-go result just rules out the existence of uh, a set of transversal gates that is universe. It, it doesn't tell us you know, what transversal gates are uh, possible or what transversal gates uh, can we even hope to implement. So that's where, um, so this is more like uh, uh, qualitative, and now uh, there is a follow-up theorem by uh, Bravi and Kini uh, that has more of a, a quantitative flavor to it. And uh, that one, um, so, so here notice, you know, I didn't assume anything about quantum error correcting code. But for this theorem, I need to assume that I have a topological stabilizer code. And that is uh, on some lattice in the dimensions. So on some lattice lambda. Okay, uh, of linear size L. And here, uh, let me remind you what this topological means in this context. So this ties back to our discussion that we had in our uh, first lecture. And so when we talk about topological stabilizer codes, uh, what we assume here is first uh, we have some set of generators of this stabilizer code, uh, meaning um, that the uh, uh, stabilizers that generate the stabilizer group, right? And we can choose them. Uh, we can choose the generating set in in a fashion that uh, for every uh, stabilizer that generates this uh, this is code, uh, it's um, its support is contained within some uh, hypercube uh, of linear size R. Um, and R here is constant. So, you know, th this is just uh, saying that our stabilizers, uh, the, 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 um, the generating set is supported locally on this. Uh, lattice, okay, and there was this other, uh, there was this other uh, condition that uh, that I was uh, assuming. Uh, when we say topological codes, we also uh, want that the distance of the code grows as the linear system size grows, and uh, this is needed for Bravikini condition, uh, and. Um, it's not just you know uh, some uh, spurious assumption that I make. Uh, this is needed for the for this uh, for, for that. So um, okay, that's that's great. But let, let's see what what does this. Uh, ah, all right, I didn't tell you what the theorem says. Okay, so <laughs> uh, Bravi Koenig. Uh, this is the assumption. I have a topological stabilizer code on on a lattice in the dimensions, and then what I have is the following. Uh, any uh, constant uh, depth quantum circuit uh, implements um, 
uh, all right, uh, then uh, any, I should say, any logical gate implemented via, sorry for that, constant depth quantum circuit um, is in the diff level of the Clifford hierarchy. And let me unpack this statement in a second. So, Bravik, so Easton Kniel tells us no universal set of transversal gates. Bravikini tells us that if we have topological codes in the dimensions, then all that we can hope for is uh, gates from some set that is called the, the diff level of the Clifford hierarchy. So um, what is this Clifford hierarchy? Um, so the first level of the Clifford hierarchy is defined to be a Pauli operators. Okay, so that's 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 uh, the starting point, and then uh, the K uh, or what should I say the uh, M level, M plus one level of the Clifford hierarchy is defined as the set of all unitaries uh, such that for any um, for any um, Pauli gate from the first uh, level of, uh, of the Clifford hierarchy, uh, U, P, U dagger is in the level one below. Okay. So that's the definition. You know, the M plus one level is defined uh, as all unitaries that map Pauli operators by conjugation to the level one below. So what would be the second level? The second level would be just unitary gates that map Paulis to Paulis. So that is the Clifford group. So uh, this is a subset, yes, because those, uh, those uh, levels are uh, sets. Let me, let me tell you uh, that. So, so the first one is, the Pauli group, it's a group as well. The second level is the Clifford group. And uh, you can convince yourself that um, higher level contains lower level. So this is the Clifford group. So this is Pauli. This is Clifford. And then you have the third level and so on and so forth. Um, the third level and higher levels will not be groups. And they will be not uh, groups because uh, you don't have, uh, you know, the uh, product of two uh, unitaries that are uh, in the third level or higher is, uh, is not guaranteed to be in the third level. Um, because, you know, uh, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't have had the universal gate set. And, you know, all the gates that are not in the Clifford group are, are called non-Clifford gates. And to get a universal gate set, all that we need is we need to be able to realize the Clifford group. And this we can do with, say, the Hadamard gate and C-node gate. And we need any gate that is non-Clifford gate. For instance, the T-gate that I mentioned there is a non-Clifford gate, so we're good. Okay, so... Uh, yes, so it's a unitary that maps Paulis to unitaries that are in one level below. So the third level would be defined as unitaries that take Paulis and give you Clifford uh, gates. So for instance, the T gate is like that because the T gate takes uh, Pauli X and maps it to uh, S gate, one I. Um, well, um, it's an infinite uh, hierarchy, right? But, but there exist gates that are not in the hierarchy. So, 
and we think it as a, one is a pile before gate and then next level pile. Before that's right. That's right. Oh, uh, that that may be that may be helpful. We can define this just to give you an intuition what those gates are. Uh, R D gate. I define it as a diagonal gate, one e to i pi over two to the d minus one. Sorry, the subscript got really small. Um, so for d equals one, I would have uh, one e to i pi, which is minus one. That's the z gate, okay? So r d is the d in d level. So I get z gate, good. For two, I have one i, which is the s gate, and uh, and so on and so forth. But basically, the higher the level, the finer the rotation. And another example of a um, div level Clifford gate, and here, let me say that this is the truly div level, meaning that it does not belong into the d minus one level. Another example of a div level gate would be d qubit control z gate that is defined uh, on some basis vectors b uh, b1 through uh, b d as minus one phase if all of them are plus one and uh, not, uh, plus one if uh, in any other case right so just the phase gate that implements minus one sign if all the bits are plus one, uh, if all the bits are one. It, yes, those are in the D level and they are not in the D minus one level. So uh, the quest of doing fault tolerant quantum computation, implementing, uh, implementing it in a fault tolerant way is the quest about how do we do, because Clifford gates are easy usually, so we don't worry about them, but the quest is how do we do non-Clifford gates? In particular, how do we do the T gate? How do we do the CCZ gate on encoded information, okay? So how does this, you know, so what does the uh, this theorem tell us, right? Imagine we have a two-dimensional topological code, say, you know, the TORC code. This means that all the gates that we can hope for to implement uh, with constant depth quantum circuits are in the second level. Second level is Clifford. So you see, we have a problem. If we restrict our attention to, you know, those simple constant depth quantum circuits that are good from the perspective of how they propagate errors. So we need something more. So, you know, this is for instance, a motivation why why one may consider um, going to higher dimensional uh, spaces and considering codes that live there, because for them, this limitation uh, is lifted, right? Because if I consider a three-dimensional code, now I can hope, I'm not guaranteed that I can do it, but I can hope uh, to get um, the T gate that is a non clifford gate. Uh, yeah, so so you know the, it would be like the converse, basically, right? Yeah. Um, so um, you can uh, let me think. Um, I think um, I so I'm I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that, but uh, um, you can. Uh, I think log that would be not good enough, but uh, but I'm uh, I think uh, I think you wouldn't be able to. Yeah, I, I I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, but um, the point uh, the point here is, you know, uh, we don't even know whether we can realize certain gates, right? Because this is just an upper bound of what we can do. So, um, but it turns out that we can achieve that, and we can achieve that with the family of uh, color codes in the dimensions or even you know the good old uh, torque code um, this gate uh, both of those gates are are uh, nicely uh, realizable 
with, say, you know, the family of the color codes, and they can be realized not only uh, they can be uh, realized by transversal. So it's as simple as it gets. Basically. Uh, that's right. That's that, that's a good question. So um, imagine you take the color code in three dimensions that has the transversal T gate. It's a CSS code, so it will have also a C not gate. So uh, you would get a contradiction with Easton Knill if it also had a transversal Hadamard gate. So it cannot have a transversal. But uh, you can resolve this. Uh, you can um, circumvent Easton Knill in a, a very sleek and easy way uh, by considering subsystem codes and doing uh, code switching. Um, you can have two realizations of the uh, 3D um, uh, color code. One has the transversal T gate, uh, and the other one has a transversal Hadamard gate. Both have C nodes, and you can uh, code switch back and forth via gauge fixing in a fault tolerant fashion. And that way, you avoid the Easting Knill theorem in a very simple way because the Theorem posits that there does not exist a single quantum error correcting code. And here we're uh, swapping between two codes. Okay. Um, okay, so I think this is what I wanted to cover in the first part uh, with regards to limitations. Ah, uh, right. So, so uh, we motivated the uh, going, you know, that one may consider, you know, dimensional codes. This is not just a, a theor uh, theoretical exercise. It, it may play some role. And uh, let me just uh, make one more comment, very quick one. Actually, we may, uh, so we, we may think uh, about the following. Um, what would happen if I had the, say, the 2D torque code, right? And I still want constant depth quantum circuits, but I allow gates to be non-local. Would that buy me anything? Because just, just think of it, you know, our experimental friends build some device, they have 2D layout, and now they can work really hard, put a lot of money and sweat and realize non-local gates, but we still want the depth to be constant because we don't want some uh, crazy spread of errors. Would that buy you anything? It turns out that you can uh, prove a version of uh, bravi Kinnig that is applicable actually to any stabilizer code, but I don't want to go into the details, that limits the level of the Clifford hierarchy that you can reach. And um, if you apply this theorem to the 2D toric code, you will not go beyond Clifford. So building you know, this extra feature buys you nothing from the perspective of computation. That's right. In non-local meaning geometric and non-local. So you know, just think of that you can do C nodes between anything. No local. Uh, yes. So, um, so uh, the, the generalization uh, is uh, in this paper uh, by uh, me and two co-authors, Thomas Joachim O'Connor and Ted Yoder. Uh, so there we assume that we have um, any stabilizer or subsystem uh, code, and we need to compute certain quantities like the min minimum distance and maximum distance, which uh, tells you what's the weight of the easiest uh, Easiest, I, I didn't want to get into that, but let me just write it very quickly. So we prove su such an, in, in a, um, uh, su su the statement is the following. So you compute certain quantities, uh, maximum distance, which is the weight of the most expensive logical operator, a minimum distance that corresponds to the regular code distance, and the quantity called the disjointness that uh, in spirit captures how many operate uh, how many representatives that implement a given logical operator k 
can you pack so that they don't overlap too much? So for the torque code, this guy would be L because you can pack you know, logical operators, uh, representatives of the same logical operator, and they would not overlap. And we showed that you know, if you have a code and you uh, uh, calculate those quantities, it may be difficult to calculate. It is actually difficult to calculate them. But if you have some bounds on what those quantities are, then you can find uh, integer m uh, such that d up is upper bounded by d down times uh, delta to the power of minus uh, m minus one. You can you can find you know the minimum uh, the the smallest integer such that this inequality holds, and this m would be the level of the Clifford hierarchy that you can uh, you can hope to reach. And if you apply this to you know the Torah code with non-local gates, meaning um, non-local interactions, maybe I should say, uh, then uh, you get the second level. Okay, so I hope I uh, motivated uh, motivated why we want to get to get beyond topological codes. Ah, yeah. Oh, sorry. One more thing. One more thing. And then, then we're done. Um, so I was talking about gates, but actually the code parameters are also not that great. Um, and there's the theorem by Bravi, Pullen, and Terhal. And here, what I assume is that I have some geometrically local code. So here, in spirit, you know, I just, I, I don't need this assumption. I, I just need uh, my checks are geometrically local. Uh, this code is on some on some on some lattice again uh, lambda in uh, in the dimensions and then what those guys prove is that the parameters of my code uh, the number of logical qubits uh, is upper bounded by some constant c times the number of qubits um, times the code distance to the power of two over D minus one. Okay, so they prove such a bound. So what would that entail for, um, for 2D codes? We would get in 2D, we would get K is upper bounded by uh, C times N times uh, D squared. Sorry, no, no, um, what am I doing? Um, it's the other way around. Uh, this guy should be on this side. Um, sorry for that. Okay, so in two dimensions, if we wanted to have a number of logical qubits that scales linearly in N, we would have the code distance. Also, a code distance that is constant. Also, if we wanted, and notice that D can only square as root N. So, um, yeah, so we cannot simultaneously have K dot scales with n and d that scales with n. And uh, th this, this is not possible. And also in two dimensions, we can only get d that scales as root n. And this is, this is realized with the Toric code. And from that perspective, we see that uh, the Toric code is, is optimal here, right? Because this is constant, this is root n, and the inequality is saturated. Okay, so I hope that this motivates why we want to get 
past uh, 2D, you know, uh, with this um, gate story. And um, this result also, um, I hope, motivates why we may want to get rid of this assumption about geometric locality, um, because uh, we will not get good codes, which by definition have code parameters that scale linearly in N. So it was not known until uh, a recent construction was proposed. Um, but uh, yes, I, I don't know what the status of the of the proof is, whether you know it is correct or not. But yeah, it, it was it was not known whether it is saturated in higher dimensions. Don't hear me. Stabilize. Um, it would be like a stabilizer code, yes. Uh, no, uh, it would be for commuting projectors. So it would be more general. Um, okay, so now uh, let me get to, you know, what I promised in the, so I'm getting to what I promised in the title, which is quantum LDPC codes, right? So, um, so to talk about quantum LDPC codes, let me start briefly, briefly. So don't query me too much. And also, this is not going to be an exhaustive overview of what was happening because there was a lot of uh, exciting progress recently. I'll just give you some flavor and sprinkle a few buzzwords here and there so that, you know, if you're interested, you can, you know, look it up. Um, but um, to talk about quantum LDPC codes, we, we probably should talk a little bit about LDPC codes or in general, we should talk about classical codes. I know that uh, this sounds weird because we started with quantum codes and now we're finishing with classical codes. But I hope you know that given your Kondesmeyer background and intuition with the toric code, you know, thinking about quantum code that is a toric code was more intuitive rather than thinking about classical code. So, you know, maybe we're going the other opposite direction that normally people uh, go. But, you know, let, let's see how it, uh, how it works for, for you guys. So, um, so what is a classical code? Well, I have some bits, okay, they are zero or one. And then I have some checks that check what is the combined parity of, of the bits. So uh, I can depict a classical code as a bipartite graph where uh, circles would be bits, uh, squares would be checks. And then I, I draw a line, I connect uh, a bit with a check if the check support is supported on that bit, if the check checks that bit, right? as, the, as the name uh, suggests. So, um, okay, so, so this is for instance, a configuration. So uh, what would that mean? Well, I can think of, uh, so, so this check, I can think of it as a binary vector, one, one, zero, one, zero. This would mean that this check is supported on the first bit, second bit, not on the third, but on fourth. And uh, this guy, you know, it would be zero, one, one, zero, one. Okay, this is just a binary representation of the check. But, you know, I can think of it as, as a matrix. Let me denote it, uh, this matrix H. It is called the parity check matrix. And what is a classical code? Classical code by definition is kernel of H. So classical code is a subspace of bit strings uh, such that uh, they, uh, when, I, uh, when I measure their checks, those checks are satisfied because I do hear addition Modulo two. So uh, yeah, so so classical code is just the kernel of this parity check matrix. Yes. Sorry. Yes, sorry. That's like a, like a um, so for instance, think of check as a um, Z check. Z check would uh, would basically measure how many uh, you know uh, how many pluses 
and minuses you have, right? You have to have even number of minuses for it to be satisfied, right? Yes, so this means that those are your qubits. Uh, so it measures Pauli uh, Z, Z, Z on those guys. That's what it does. And then the number you wrote down? Those numbers encode the support of that Pauli uh, stabilizer. Okay. Yeah. okay. You didn't write down the function. So I'm not talking about quantum codes yet. I'm just uh, defining a classical code. A classical code is a subspace F2 linear. Uh, I have F2 linear vector space associated with my bits. Uh, so th those are like uh, bit strings. All the bit strings uh, that are in the kernel of this parity check matrix, this is the code by definition. And But you can think of it, of course, you can think of it from coming from quantum perspective, that those would be my qubits, and I measure Pauli Z checks. And uh, this picture denotes uh, what is the support of the operator that I'm measuring. So, and this bit string just denotes that. Okay, so once we have, you know, code that is um, in the uh, code that is the kernel of this. Uh, party check matrix, I can think of, you know, okay, I can have vector spaces here. C1 would be, uh, would have bits as its basis. A C0 would have those party checks at, as its basis. And I can have a map that maps from C1 to C2 to be this party check matrix. And for this sequence, the code would be defined as the kernel of H. I didn't do much here. I just uh, introduced a vector space here and vector space there and a map there, which, which defines the classical code. And uh, so now if I have some error here on, on my bits. So, you know, my bits should uh, should satisfy those parity checks, but you know maybe some uh, some bit flipped here. So now uh, what would happen uh, if if my bit flips here? Uh, this check doesn't check it, but this check checks it. So it will be unsatisfied this check, and uh, the syndrome that I get. It can be, so if, if my error is E, then the syndrome I get is HE, okay? So um, I'm building on this intuition that we saw earlier with the Torah code, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is the classical code. Um, but now I can have a different, a different uh, classical code uh, that is supported on, on the same bits. And for instance, I can have the following parity checks. Okay, so this is one classical code. This is the other classical code with uh, uh, described by the parity check matrix uh, H prime. What would this parity check matrix be? Well, this check is supported on the first three guys. So it's one, 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 zero, zero. This guy is supported on the third and fourth. So it's zero, zero, one, zero, one. This would be this parity check matrix that describes this code. So I have now, now I have two classical codes. If I have two classical codes, uh, I, I can define a quantum code. This is the CSS uh, construction, but I cannot define a quantum code for any uh, two classical codes using the CSS construction. They have to satisfy certain requirements. So if, so back to Leo's uh, question, if those were Z checks, we would want those guys to be X checks. Would there be any requirement that they would need to satisfy two 
to give us a good, uh, to give us a, a legitimate stabilizer code? Exactly, because X, uh, checks need to commute with Z checks. Uh, you can convince yourself that how, how do I compute that? Well, uh, so for instance, the overlap of those guys, I can take, um, I can take uh, this vector and multiply it by a uh, transpose of this vector. And if it's zero, then the overlap is even, so they commute. But in general, the condition would be H times H prime transpose is zero. Okay, so notice that now I have this condition. So how about I write C2? Yeah, how about I introduce this uh, vector space associated with those checks? Let me call it C2. And now let me have this map to be H prime transpose. Then I have this structure, C2, C1, C0, and the condition is if I compose this linear operator with that linear operator, it gives me the zero operator. So I think we've seen that already, right? So um, I just uh, explained to you, you know, the CSS um, code construction, where we take two classical codes, that satisfy a certain condition, and we make a quantum code. And you know, and we see that you know this, there there is this uh, chain complex that that we can have, and uh, vice versa, right? If if we started with a chain complex, I could define a CSS stabilizer code by uh, you know looking at those operators at those boundary operators and interpreting them as the parity check matrices corresponding to um, X-type stabilizers and Z-type stabilizers. So my comment from, I don't know, lecture one or lecture two, that might have been a little bit cryptic when I was telling you, oh, you know, those uh, partials, those boundary operators, they correspond to support of my Z-check, and this would be the syndrome, or if I take, you know, like the transpose of, uh, this uh, linear operator viewed as a binary matrix, then I could read off the support of my checks, right? So uh, I hope that now it's all clear. They're not the same. Oh, that's that's the construction. That's 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 the construction. And I very much appreciate your comment because this brings me to, uh, to the next topic, which is how do we construct other codes? Right? Is this the only way? How we combine two classical codes to get uh, a quantum code? Uh, but before we, we get there, yes. How, how can we know the parameter of the new code? Ah, okay. So uh, parameters of new code. Let me just. Uh, consult my note. So the parameter of uh, new code, so uh, the, okay, so let's see. Uh, so the, let me use capital letters to denote uh, parameters of the quantum code. The number of, um, the number of uh, qubits in a new code is the same as the number of bits in the classical code, right? Because bits are supported here. Uh, the, number of logical qubits encoded in the quantum code will be n minus um, rank of uh, one parity check matrix and the rank of uh, the other parity check matrix. And you may be like, what is this? Well, this just tells you how many independent checks you have. So remember we were like counting how many independent faces we have in the toric code. Okay, so we had L square minus one. How many independent vertex like operators do we have? L square minus one. This is, you know, this just boils down to, okay, I, you know, I had the parity check matrix that captures those faces. You know, what's the rank of this matrix? That's kind of it. 
and the number of logical qubits in the encoded in the CSS code would be n minus uh, rank h minus rank h prime, which is just you know the number of qubits minus the number of independent stabilizer generators. Okay, and the distance of this code is a minimum a distance uh, of of those two codes, those two classical codes. So, and this again kind of corresponds to um, yeah. Uh, parameters of quantum code, parameters of classical code. Um, okay, so so uh, quantum. Uh, so this is your quantum code. This chain complex defines your quantum code. You place, you know, lecture one. A uh, qubits are identified with uh, with um, our basis of this a vector space. Those are z. Stabilizers, those are X stabilizers. Uh, no, uh, what I what I told you is, you know, the whole uh, lecture one, two was spent on how do we, you know, think of a quantum code that, you know, it arises from the chain complex. This is the chain complex. So you read off your quantum code from this chain complex, right? Here. Um, that's right. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, uh, one quick thing, and we're so let me answer this question with a, a quick comment. It turns out that you can you can uh, have good quantum uh, codes that are CSS. So basically, uh, it was proven by uh, Shore and Steen at the early days of quantum information that uh, there actually exist uh, good classical uh, codes. And here good, uh, Means that you know the number of bits, uh, sorry, that the number of uh, logical bits is proportional to n, and the distance is uh, proportional to n, and uh, all those codes also satisfy the constraint that their parity check matrices uh, satisfy this condition. So H H transpose is zero. So basically, I can take the same classical code here and there. And I can get a good quantum code. So we would be almost done, but there is one problem with this construction. Those uh, classical codes have parity check matrices that are not sparse. What does sparsity of parity check matrix mean? Well, if your matrix is sparse, it means that every parity check is supported on few locations, on a constant number of locations. And also every bit or qubit supports only a few uh, checks. And this is, this is, so we don't care about that that much when it comes to classical codes, because we just add you know, zeros or ones. But for quantum uh, codes, we very much care about that because we need to measure those parity checks. We need to measure those Pauli operators. And uh, if we have to measure microscopic operators, you know, the chances of doing that fault tolerantly would be pretty slim. Or, you know, the errors could propagate, you know, this is this is the condition that we don't want to uh, that we don't want to give up. And this is the condition low density parity check. Uh, this this means that you know, if you see low density parity check, what it means is that the parity check matrix is sparse. Okay, so um, does it follow? Like, is it true that there cannot be the loaded divide effect to satisfy the source condition? Sorry, sorry, like, is it not possible to have the source in condition condition be satisfied by loaded divide effect? Um, so that's what was proven. 
uh, basically a year ago or two years ago, there was a, um, a series of very exciting groundbreaking results in a short period of time where people proved that good quantum LDPC codes exist. But you know, from the you know early days construction, we just knew that there are good quantum LD, uh, there are good quantum codes, but they were not LDPC because those classical codes were not uh, LDPC. And uh, so, yeah. Okay. So now let me very briefly, because you know this took longer than I anticipated. Um, let me very briefly mention to you one uh, particularly exciting construction, which basically led to good quantum LDPC code. So the construction is called hypergraph or sometimes tensor or sometimes homological product uh, construction codes. Okay, so I mean, there are small differences here and there, but like basically they're all the same. So how do they work? Well, I start with some classical code that is just a map from one F2 linear vector space to another F2 linear vector space. And you know, there's the parity check matrix, right? That is this linear operator that takes me from here to there as we discussed there. And now I consider, you know, a tensor product of, of those two sequences. What do I mean by that? I consider the following structure, A tensor A, and then A tensor B, then B tensor A, then B tensor B. Okay, so those would be my vector spaces. And you can guess what the maps would be. So to go from here to there, the map is I tensor H, same here. To get from here to there, the map is H tensor I, and here as well. Okay, so we have some structure. What does that have to do with quantum codes? Well, let me draw this. Okay, and let me add plus sign here. Okay, maybe this 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 will tell you what I'm doing. I'm taking this this square structure, rotate it and smash it to get C two. C1, C0, where this is A tensor A, uh, that one is A tensor B plus B tensor A, and the last one is B tensor B. And my uh, boundary operators are, um, I tensor H, H tensor I, and the other one is H tensor I, I tensor H. Sorry. Uh, you can convince yourself that a composition of those boundary operators is the zero operator. Well, uh, how do I see that? Well, if I apply this this guy to that guy, I get uh, H tensor H plus H tensor H. We're doing uh, addition modulo two, it's zero. Um, okay, you know, if you don't see it, think about it. Um, but that's basically the 
hypergraph tensor homological product uh, code construction. Um, and in particular, um, if we use a good uh, classical uh, LDPC code here, what we get, so if we use good LDPC code, this construction would yield uh, would yield a quantum uh, LDPC code uh, with parameters k that scales as n and the distance that scales as root n. So okay, so we have a quantum LDPC code, constant rate, but the distance is root n. So we're not there yet. We're not there yet, but it's it's reasonable. And um, and uh, there could be uh, there were uh, really exciting works that built on this uh, simple construct on this you know. Uh, simple to explain construction, not necessarily simple to come up with. Um, I'm not sure I have time to... Uh, well, I, I gave you the chain complex which, define, which defines the code, you know. So I would invite you to, you know, come up with that. Uh, so here, I, so right, so it's a visualization, but there is this complex, uh, there is this um, notion of taking a tensor product of chain complexes. Right, and uh, so this is a mathematical object, and you use this mathematical object to define a quantum code. In the same way, you know, how do we define the toric code? We had a cellulation of the lattice, and then we associated qubits with edges, you know, z checks with faces, and x uh, stabilizers with vertices. Okay, so what was I going to say? Ah. Um, I, I'll leave this exercise to you uh, to show that uh, the toric code uh, can be obtained in this uh, hypergraph product construction uh, from two repetition codes. Okay, so maybe let's call it homework. And uh, yeah, if you if you solve this homework, you will understand what this construction is about. If we are too good for the LCP, it's difficult. Why do you put with the here? So this will be a CSS code. This is a CSS code. So this quantum LDPC code is CSS. Okay. Okay, so um, so there was this uh, problem in, in, in quantum coding theory that for for a very long time, uh, uh, for a very long time, uh, quantum LDPC codes had this scaling of the distance that was basically root n up to polylogarithmic correct. And it was, uh, and those, uh, this, this, this limitation was um, removed by a construction by um, by uh, based on the hypergraph product codes. We're talking about the construction from 2020, uh, Ha Hastings O'Donnell, uh, where they where they considered uh, codes called fiber bundle codes. So basically, no, I, I will not explain that to you, but what they what they consider is their construction is that they view this, this code that we're using as uh, some base and that code as some bundle. And in, te in terms of, uh, in, instead of taking just a, a tensor product, they do some twist here. And uh, what they could do is they could get codes uh, quantum LDPC codes 
uh, for which k would scale as uh, n to the power of three fifths over uh, polylog. And uh, so did the so did the distance and three over five polylog. Okay, so this barrier of square root n was uh, broken. And uh, yeah, and uh, there is a bunch of other interesting constructions, namely lifted uh, products codes. Um, also balance product codes, they all borrow on this idea of hypergraph uh, product codes. But what they do is um, notice that here we have too many physical qubits. <laughs> the distance scales only as root n. So what those constructions use is uh, they reduce the number of qubits Uh, by uh, by reducing the symmetry of the code, so at the expense of reducing symmetry. And those constructions led to good quantum LDPC codes uh, where K scales as N, D scales as N. And there is one more very exciting construction that also gives a rise to good LDPC codes, uh, namely quantum tunnel codes. Okay. So, and this is the forefront of research in quantum error correction. Okay. So, I hope that I I gave you some very brief um, overview of, you know, starting from, you know, the classical code to the forefront of uh, quantum error correction research. I know that, you know, bits and pieces may not be uh, easy to understand on the fly, but, you know, those constructions, um, you know, here you should, you should be able to, you know, uh, you should be able to make yourself familiar. Those, those guys tend to be more, more complex, but uh, the hypergraph code should be uh, should be fairly understandable to you. Any quick questions on this one? Um. Well, you know, <laughs> that's what you set to do, right? So uh, you wanted to do good quantum LDPC codes, so you started with. Not so good quantum LDPC codes, and you slowly improve the parameters. I, I don't know. I don't have a better answer to this question. So now we have a good code. What's next? Um, well, so for instance, with those uh, quantum tunnel codes, uh, they provided uh, a proof of uh, NLTS conjecture. So uh, what next? That's a um, for, from a quantum information perspective, what's next? Well, we should be thinking about how those codes could be realized um, in real life, uh, how to do, how to do, uh, how to do decoding, how to do gates. And um, so th this is vastly open. We, we know very little about uh, you know, uh, good LDPC codes, or maybe not so good LDPC codes, but uh, the ones that are not just you know the surface code, the color code. We, um, yeah, it, it's it's most most of the problems are pretty open. Uh, so these are theoretical models. What are they? Um, bad. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so, so for instance, there was this uh, interesting work by uh, Baspin and Krishna, uh, where they were uh, asking 
uh, not about good LDPC codes, but um, say you have an LDPC code in two dimensions, uh, but it's not fully geometrically local, uh, but uh, you, you add some non-local interactions. So basically they, they say, uh, where should I write that? They say uh, that if we're in two dimensions and if we have some quantum uh, low density parity check code uh, that has parameters that scale as n to uh, root n plus epsilon, uh, then this requires uh, that we have uh, something like the number of interactions that scale at least as uh, root uh, plus epsilon. Uh, and they those interactions need to be uh, need to be of length mm. like n to the power of epsilon. So basically what it says is if your distance scales epsilon faster than this uh, root n barrier, then you've got to have uh, root n plus epsilon uh, non-local interactions and they have to be over the range n epsilon. Um, but this is like, this is in two, di two dimensions, we, we, don't we don't have good understanding here. Uh, well, uh, the work that I mentioned very briefly about the disjointness holds there because I, you know, there is no assumption there. But uh, but you have no idea what those parameters are. So you know you would yeah. So the, uh, but yes, but but uh, yeah, but uh, our our result about the disjointness uh, establishes that any for any stabilizer code transversal gates will be in some finite level of the Clifford heart. Okay. So um, I hope I gave you some exposition to quantum LDPC codes. Uh, I still have 10 minutes, so maybe I will very briefly squeeze in uh, or at least motivate why we want to do or what it is, this single shot quantum error correction. So I have a few slides, and but how do I do it? Um, thank you. Okay, so here we talked about quantum error correction, where you know I have I have um, stabilizers measured in some perfect way, no measurement errors. But QEC itself is a noisy process, as Victor was telling us uh, yesterday. You know, uh, he he told us a little bit about fault tolerance. You know. We need to be to a certain degree paranoid, and we need to be thinking that every single operation may fail, and we we have to do it, you know, in a robust way. We need to do error correction. Error correction is not, uh, you know, we cannot be like, oh, errors happen only here. But when we do error correction, you know, it's perfect, right? So this would <laughs> this is not how the world works. So, uh, in particular, we have to measure parity checks by, you know, running short circuits, right? If I want to measure ZZ on the top two wires. I've got to prepare an ancilla state, you know, then the, do the C not gate and then measure the ancilla if I work in the circuit mode. I may have some other processes, uh, physical processes that allow me to measure this parity check. Nevertheless, we cannot assume that they would be perfect. So, and th 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 this poses a problem because, for instance, for our beloved uh, the toric code and the coding problem there, you know, if one of the party checks uh, reported the wrong outcome, I would have an odd number of guys and I would be unable to pair them up. So matching would be impossible. But you know, there's a standard solution to this problem. 
Namely, I just repeat measurements. And uh, that, is, that is sufficient. That is a simple solution. Uh, but, uh, and then what I would do is I would see some um, word lines, um, like uh, the history of my excitations in space-time. And then what the problem of decoding would boil down to uh, matching the endpoints there. So in spirit, it would be very analogous to what we discussed in the 2D Tor code. Uh, but instead of matching points in 2D, we would be matching points in 3D. Um, but you know, uh, what what we what we may not want to do is uh, the penalty that we pay because we need to do repeated rounds of measurements. So our quantum error correction gadget that we that we have in our circuit would be uh, slowed down. Alternatively, you can think of the logical clock speed being reduced by the factor of the code distance with respect to the clock speed of your physical gates. Um, so uh, that's not necessarily what we want to do uh, because suddenly uh, algorithms that may run in, in a day would need to be run in, say, a month. And uh, even if our distance is, say, you know, 30 you know, or 20, um, we, we may not be happy with this, this slowdown. So there exist methods how we can do something smarter than just repeat measurements. But if we apply those methods to the 2D toric code, we would uh, lose geometric locality of checks that we need to measure. And we also uh, will lose a constant weight of parity checks that we uh, need to measure. Uh, so what those methods uh, rely on is instead of measuring checks that are independent, we measure more checks. There are some redundancies and we leverage that, you know, roughly speaking. Okay, so um, what I want to show you very briefly, and you can talk to me later uh, today, is there's a different way to realize the toric code. It's going to be a, a three-dimensional version of the toric code, and it's not going to be a stabilizer code. It's going to be a subsystem code. Uh, but basically, this code would be uh, or is a new topological code that is capable of single shot uh, quantum error correction. What I mean here is I have my three dimensional subsystem code. I measure its um, parity checks, its gauge, uh, gauge operators once. They are all geometrically local and they may all be noisy. Nevertheless, I can use this information from this snapshot uh, of history to use uh, to do reliable error correction. And this is in contrast with the 2D Torical, because if I had a snapshot of you know, where my excitations are at this moment, and if I use only this snapshot, I could not do reliable error correction. And this, this approach uh, has no QEC induced slowdown. I don't need to do those repeated rounds of measurements. But there is, of course, a price that we pay Instead of having an, a system that natively lives in two spatial dimensions, this guy lives natively in three spatial dimensions. But what is it? So it can be realized on a cubic lattice. So here I colored cubes in red and blue uh, in a checkerboard fashion. Qubits are placed on the edges of the cubic lattice. And I take some cubic region of the uh, cubic lattice. I want to have. Uh, open boundary conditions. And um, the definite code is defined in the following way. For every blue uh, cube, I would introduce Z checks. There would be eight Z checks. They are depicted here as triangles. They are weight three. And analogously for every red cube, I would introduce eight weight three checks. And it is a subsystem code because, as you may notice, is there a pointer here? Uh, um, oh, thanks. As you may notice, this uh, check, this Z check, has uh, overlap of one qubit with that X check, the anti-commute. So it's a subsystem code, it's not a stabilizer. Um, 
so that's the bulk of the model. On the boundary, I need to do some adjustments, but not worry about that. Uh, right, I, I uh, so those checks don't commute. Uh, but what are the stabilizer operators of the subsystem code? Uh, they would be identified with um, they would be identified with cubes, with with volumes, and they would be weight twelve in the bulk. And um, notice that they do commute with uh, parity checks because now this z stabilizer would have even overlap with this x check. So um, those are the stabilizers of the construction. Importantly, they can be uh, formed from uh, gauge operators in two different ways. I can multiply either this quadruple of a uh, parity checks, uh, gauge operators, or the other quadruple of um, gauge operators. And uh, this, is, this is key uh, to what we're going to talk about in the next five minutes. So, um, there is this structure of the code that is similar. Ask me later, I can explain to you. Uh, but for now, take it, uh, take it, uh, uh, take my word for it. So the decoding problem here is the same as the decoding problem of the 2D tour code. I can visualize my errors as string-like errors, and their endpoints would be the violated stabilizers. Stabilizers are the ones that detect errors in the conventional subsystem code, right? Uh, gauge operators do not. I'm not talking about floppy uh, codes here. This is just the good old uh, subsystem. Um, I'm talking about uh, 3D. It's three spatial dimensions, three spatial <laughs> dimensions. Uh, so, uh, well, in a second, in a second. Um, so, because, we, so, okay, this is what we would see. The decoding problem would be the same as the 2D uh, Toriko decoding problem if we were to measure stabilizers. Because there, it would really be like string like operators. We measure their endpoints. That's it, we're done. But we're, we actually measure those gauge checks. They don't necessarily commute with one another, so they will be randomized. Uh, nevertheless, if I take a product, of four gauge operators, it reliably tells me what is the outcome of this stabilizer operator. Same for the other um, quadruple. And uh, what uh, also, if I multiply all of them, they have to give me plus one. So if I now think about like the lattice that is kind of redrawn from that lattice, but I don't have time to explain it, in a, you would see that uh, if I visualize uh, gauge operators that give me minus one outcome, they would satisfy Gauss law and they would have loop-like structure. So basically, if you were to measure your gauge operators, you would see this mess of loops of strings, but they would form closed loops and they would have two colors, yellow and green, which basically correspond to whether we're picking those parity checks or the other set of parity checks. And Importantly, the, the signature of errors, which is the violated stabilizers, those would be uh, points where yellow flux turns into green flux. So we can really think about the decoding problem here as I have point-like charges that are connected via fluxes, yellow and green, but those fluxes are not energetically suppressed. So they, can, they will explore the whole system. And this is the decoding problem that we're solving here. Okay. Um, so how do we solve the problem in a realistic setting? In a realistic setting, we so okay. If I have a boundary, you know, loops can also uh, fluxes can also terminate at the boundary. But in a realistic setting, I have measurement errors, so I would not see closed loops. I would see some chopped loops. So this is the configuration I might see. But then what, what I do is I have the following two-stage decoder, uh, single-shot decoder. In the first stage, I see this collection of broken loops. But then what I can do is I can patch them up. I can repair the loop-like structure. OK, so I just you know connected it in some fashion to make sure that 
in the bulk, I have closed loops, and you know those those fluxes can terminate at the boundary. And then having this uh, this um, this valid um, configuration, I can reliably estimate those point-like charges where one flux turns into the other flux. And this is those are the blue dots. And I forget about fluxes. I just use those blue uh, dots. And I do the matching here in an analogous way as in the 2D Tor code match. Importantly, both steps can be realized with the minimum perfect matching algorithm that we talked about. Okay, so you know you, what you can do is you can numerically simulate how this model performs. So what we study is we considered repeated rounds of quantum error correction, where in each round we introduce new errors into the system, then we extracted parity checks from that round. And we used only the measurement outcomes from that round to do error correction. And we repeated that T rounds. So for instance, here I plot how the logical error rate uh, scales as a function of physical error rate for different code distances if I do four repeated rounds of quantum error correction. But then what we can consider is what would happen if I, uh, if I took many QEC uh, rounds. So, you know, you can plot how the threshold scales as a function of QEC cycles. And we see that our code operates above uh, 1%. So this is, this is a very good robustness to uh, errors. Okay, so this is, um, this is numerics, but here you can actually prove that this code works. So what do we really prove? We prove that Right. So, first of all, because we have measurement errors, we are not guaranteed, and with high probability, we will not go back to the code space. Think of this from like um, you know, a many body perspective. You know, you want to go back to the ground space, but you're not gonna be uh, in the ground space. You're gonna be you know above the ground space. But the point is that this residual noise will be kept under control. This is the whole point of single shot quantum error correction. You can do those rounds of error correction using instantaneous information about the errors in your system, and you can still do reliable quantum error correction. And if you want to see some uh, more concrete math rather than me uh, you know, hand waving about it, uh, this, is, this is basically the equation that we prove in the paper. So it means that if we have a state that is, uh, if we have a state that is encoded in this code, and then what, what, what we do is we apply some uh, local stochastic noise to it. So think of you know, IID noise that we talked about. And then what we do is we do the single shot decoder. And here the, uh, the local stochastic noise has two parameters. Uh, tau in spirit is basically the error strength. You know, uh, the epsilon here is, uh, what is the logical failure rate if I applied perfect decoder to this noise? Um, and uh, the parameter eta here captures the measurement error rate. So what the theorem says is, if I have state encoded in this code and some local stochastic noise happens, and then I apply my single shot decoder to recover from that noise, then as the result, what I get is, I get you know, a state encoded in the uh, code, with some local stochastic noise applied to it still, right? The errors don't, don't change the structure, the type, the noise type stays the same, the parameters change in uh, some way. And a non-trivial part of this, this statement is that, you know, first, you know, the noise uh, type stays the same, but also the scaling of those parameters of the residual noise. So basically the residual noise is suppressed if measurement errors are suppressed, meaning if I had perfect measurements, uh, I could get back the code space perfectly. So that's one non-trivial aspect. The other non-trivial aspect is if I'm below the threshold for, for, for this model for sufficiently small parameters of noise, I could reduce this increment delta of the logical error rate uh, 
to zero just by the sheer fact of scanning up my system. So those are non-trivial aspects of this theorem. And if you combine now n rounds, you get that, uh, or if you have t rounds of repeated adding noise and error correction, adding noise and error correction, then the residual noise will stay at bay, will be tau prime bounded, and the logical error rate would only grow linearly in T. And this is, this is all that we can hope for, right? Because if at any point we have a chance of failing, that what's the chance of failing uh, after you know, some number of times, it will be, you know, it will scale at least linearly, right? I, and if errors accumulate, it could, it could, you know, it could lead to a catastrophe very quickly. So uh, that's basically what I uh, had to say. I will just conclude with uh, one thing, which is here, we need to deal with local stochastic noise. And why is that? Um, our code, this code, has distance that scales uh, as a linear system size. And in a local stochastic noise, we would have the number of errors uh, that are present in the system that are proportional to the number of qubits. So distance scales as L, the number of errors in the system scales as L cubed. So our code operates you know, strictly beyond the regime where, where it's guaranteed to operate. So that's why we need this extra assumption about noise, local uh, being local stochastic. Uh, however, if we had quantum, a good quantum LDPC codes, we wouldn't need this assumption about local stochastic errors because we would be uh, allowed to have adversarial error that acts on a constant fraction of qubits. And then we would be able to do, uh, to do correction. And that's basically what we proved a month ago, which is we showed that quantum tunnel codes uh, that I listed on the board down there, they admit single shot quantum error correction. And um, I think with that, I would like to conclude my uh, talk. Thanks. Um, yes, so in spirit, tau is the uh, physical error rate. Epsilon is logical error rate of this noise. So if you had IID noise and if you applied perfect decoder, then this, uh, this logical error rate would be exponentially suppressed in the system size. But you, know, you, you want to decouple those two things. You don't want to have just one parameter. You want to decouple them because uh, you're interested in, you know, you will, so in this, in this statement, this residual noise, the strength, the physical strength will be kept at, kept at bay, but the logical error rate would be growing, but it will be growing linearly. Uh, right, so, um, so local stochastic noise is a generalization of IID noise. And um, what, what it is, is basically, if you ask, what is, what is the probability that I have an error on those qubits, on, you know, like one, seven, 13. The probability of having any error that is supported there and possibly somewhere else is exponentially suppressed in the size of the region where you require the error to be supported. Uh, that's right. Uh, for uh, IID noise would be p uh, p to the d. Uh, 